Good morning. We got a lot to talk about today. This show, again, was uh, brought to me by a viewer, by Linda. And Linda is, a, boy, I thought I was informed. Linda is informed. I thought I knew everything there was to know about health care, especially around 2015 and 2016. I, I was really following everything. And I this miss, I missed this completely. It's called the 21st Century Cures Act. And I bet a lot of you missed it too. And today's show, we're going to discuss this, this act and why it, it sounded good on paper and ended up being a Christmas gift to the pharmaceutical industry and a real, real problem for patients, for people who are sick. I'm going to start, though, with something called informed consent, and this is going to cycle back to this 21st Century Cures Act. Informed consent is very different than just consent. Now, we all know that when we go to a doctor or we go out for surgery, we're going to have surgery, we have to sign all kinds of forms. And this is basically what I call CYA forms. It's doctors and hospitals covering their ass. Uh, to let you know everything that could possibly go wrong and that somehow by signing this paper you agree that oh well shit happens you know I agree you can do whatever you want to me but that's not entirely correct and this is why I, I am informing you all now read every word if you have to take a picture of it because it's in that tiny print like the drug warnings on the drug labels are in tiny print, take a picture, blow it up on your camera or on your Kindle or whatever, and read it. Read every word. Because those informed consents, well, a lot of people sign them without being informed. And I have a personal story to prove this. <clears throat> so, many of you know my mother's story, that she was killed in 2004 by medical malpractice. And I believe it was a perfect storm. I don't believe just one person was to blame for my mother's death, but it started out badly the day she went in for her surgery, and here's why. Before my mother's surgery, she met with two surgeons. One was going to do her hysterectomy, which my mother needed <clears throat> for her health. And one was to remove an abdominal hernia. And she met with a surgeon that was a very nice man. She met with him. He examined her. He looked at the hernia. He said, yes, I'm going to take care of this for you. They shook hands. My mother liked him very, very much. And then we fast forward <clears throat> to April 8th, 2014, or 2004. And my mother signed all her consent forms. And they did have a lot of bad stuff in there, but we laughed about it because it's a hysterectomy. We knew, my mother and I combined knew 40 women who had hysterectomies with no problems whatsoever. And it was a, a hernia removal. Again, my mother knew lots of people, lots of her friends had had this surgery, no problem. But there was a problem on April 8th, 2004, is that the doctor my mother thought was going to remove her hernia didn't show up. And my mother wasn't told that he didn't show up. I only found out he didn't show up after my mother's surgery. Instead, he sent a, now look, this is going to sound sexist, but a basically a young female doctor, and I'll never forget her name. I'm not going to say it here. I'm not going to get sued for liable, but I know. And Hopefully, if she's watching this, she knows I know. And that's all that really matters. But this woman was younger than I was, and I was 39 at the time. Uh, she had never met my mother. She had never seen my mother's hernia. She knew nothing about my mother. And the most important thing is my mother never met her. There was no relationship. And this doctor operated on my mother without my mother's consent because my mother consented to the surgeon who she had met with and who had examined her to remove that hernia. 
She did not know this doctor. Now, how many of you want a doctor at a scheduled surgery that never met you, that you never met operating on you? And bad things happen during the surgery. <clears throat> In fact, all the stuff that my mother and I laughed about when we were looking at the consent forms, like a colostomy could be the result of complications due to this surgery. Well, they all happen. And when they say these things are rare, they are rare until they happen to you. And they happen to my mother and to me and to our family. And we lost my mother four days later because during the surgery and this hernia was had been growing for a while in my mother's belly button. And it was a delicate surgery because it was wrapped around her bowel. And during that surgery, what I believe happened, I can't prove it, but because of what happened in the four days after preceding my mother's death, I believe that her bowel was nipped during the surgery. Because day, the day after surgery, they couldn't get her off the respirator. In fact, my mother never came off the respirator after her surgery. <clears throat> And right after surgery, the next day, she was able to speak to us by writing. And then that afternoon, something happened and her kidneys started failing. And I never spoke to my mother again because she was out of it and she was on a respirator. So the kidneys failed on Friday and Saturday and Sunday, her liver started failing. And on Monday, I got a call saying that they were going to need to do a colostomy on my mother. All of that stuff in the consent form just started happening. And there's another reason that my mother probably was killed. And it's called heparin. And the reason I know about this is because of the fabulous actor Dennis Quaid, whose twins, newborn twins, were almost killed by an overdose of heparin. Now my mother was overweight and she smoked 10 cigarettes a day and we used to laugh that she didn't inhale those cigarettes. But she was a healthy woman. She did not have any chronic illnesses. She did not, was on no medications. She just had a really rotten uterus and an abdominal hernia. Her heart was strong. In fact, her heart was the last thing that gave out on that Monday morning, April 12th, 2004. After she basically died on the table while they were going to put a bag, replace her bowels with a bag. And I believe that because my mother was gonna be in bed at her weight with these surgeries, she was gonna be bedridden for a few days, they gave her heparin, which is a blood thinner because my mother also got something called DIC, and I used to know what that meant, and I don't anymore, and I really don't care. But what it is, is the blood is so thin, and it is caused by an overdose of heparin, that even sticking my mother with an intravenous needle or anything, she would bleed out. She was bleeding. That's what DIC is, and it is caused by too much heparin. And what Dennis Quaid found out was that the heparin bottles the way they were labeled, they were deceptive, and it was easy for nurses to grab the wrong dosage. And that's what they did to his twins. His twins survived. But Dennis, Twa Dennis Quaid is not Paula Luciano, the little chick from Lancaster who's accusing everyone of killing her mother. Dennis Quaid had some clout, and he went to Congress. And because of those Quaid, those beautiful angels, the Quaid twins, the labeling on heparin has been changed but it was a little too late for my mom. So this is why consent is important. And now, because I know all of this, first of all, I know there is no such thing as minor surgery. And by the way, the comedian Joan Rivers knows that too. And we're gonna talk about Joan Rivers because I learned something this weekend that also has to do with consent and who gets to do what. But as far as my mom goes, I have told my husband this, if I schedule a surgery and the day of the surgery, the doctor that I was planning to have do my surgery doesn't show up, get me the hell out of there. I don't care if I'm dosed up. You carry me out of that hospital. 
when a doctor makes a commitment to work on a patient, and my mother didn't need that hernia removed on April the 8th. She didn't. She needed the hysterectomy, and that doctor showed up, and she did a good job. She's an excellent doctor. She is my friend to this day. But if the doctor who was, they could have skipped the hernia operation, or at least they could have said to my mother, you know, Dr. X had something he had to do today. He can't do your surgery. Are you okay with this doctor doing it? And the doctor, at least the replacement doctor, the least she could have done was walk into my mother's room while she was being prepped for surgery and introduce herself. And then let my mother make the, and the informed decision. But that didn't happen. And now my mother is dead. And what happened with Joan Rivers, we all think, oh, Joan Rivers died from malpractice. Well, she did, but I learned that what happened with Joan Rivers is she was going in for a routine test, very simple test, done millions of times a day, an endoscopy. They stick a tube down your throat because she was having trouble talking. And she brought along her family physician just as a support system. The family physician was not licensed to do any procedures at this clinic where Joan was having her test. But during the procedure, her family physician decided that the doctor who was doing the endoscopy wasn't getting good pictures and she had a different way of doing it and she was going to do it. Now remember, Joan signed consent forms. She signed for the doctor she met, the gentleman, to do her endoscopy. She brought the family doctor along as a buddy to sit in and just give her support. And all of a sudden, this doctor who has no privileges at this clinic is doing a procedure after Joan Rivers' blood oxygen level was dropping and she was in trouble. Oh no, we can get a better picture. I'm going to do this new form of endoscopy. I'm going to stick something up her nose. And now Joan Rivers is dead. Now, there was a lawsuit and Joan Rivers' daughter got money, but Joan Rivers is still dead. And she didn't need to be. And again, consent. Consent. And arrogance of doctors who think they know better. Or doctors who think they can just walk into a patient's room and, and operate on someone they never met. My mother always used to like to get have a rapport with anyone, any of her doctors, anyone who was going to operate on her. She used to say, if I was your mother, what would you tell me to do? Treat me like your mother. She never had the opportunity to do that with the doctor who possibly caused her death. Maybe if she had, my mother would still be alive because the doctor would have had more of a commitment to my mother, having actually spoken with her. So informed consent. It's very important to know what you're signing. And this brings us to this 21st Century Cures Act, which um, on its face sounds really good. See, it was going to give states all this money for mental health, opening up more beds in mental health facilities so people with mental illness could get help, and treating the opioid epidemic. Now, remember what the opioid epidemic is, right? It's not actually heroin, because what actually happens is it starts with those Prescription drugs, we talked about them. Remember Vicodin, Percocet, Demerol? You know, oh, you have your tooth pulled. Are you going to be in pain? Let's give you some Vicodin. And then when the doctor says, well, your tooth is healed, you no longer get the Vicodin. They go, well, I need the Vicodin now. I need it. I'm addicted to it. That's, what, that's how this starts. And then they turn to heroin because they can get the heroin and still keep that, maintain that opioid high that they got from the painkillers, the legal prescription painkillers that the doctors wrote. So here's this Cures Act, and it's awesome. You know, it's giving all this money, but it's also giving a huge Merry Christmas gift to pharmaceutical companies, and here's why. We have something in our country called the FDA, and it is a big thorn in the side of pharmaceutical companies who want to quickly pass their new drugs so they can start making money from them. Because research takes a lot of money. They put a lot of time into making these drugs and they want them on the market. They want patients using them. And they want doctors pushing them. 
but the FDA stands in their way. And what the 21st Century Cures Act did was kind of throw the FDA, kick them to the curb a little bit. Drug companies are able to test drugs or have them used for new illnesses without patient consent or even their knowledge. This causes use of drugs on human patients for going clinical trials. It allows researchers to waive informed consent in a case where the devices tested don't pose any health risks beyond those of normal everyday life and would not direct patients care in any way. Now, well, first of all, who decides what poses a health risk beyond what is in my daily life? Because my risks in my daily life are pretty minimal. I mean, I barely leave the house. I mean, who decides what these risks are? Is, is you know, risks beyond those of normal everyday life? Well, if I sky jump or I go ski downhill skiing every day, they could give me any kind of drug because that's pretty dangerous. You know, downhill skiing, ski jumping or horseback riding. I mean, I don't do any of that shit. But who's going to decide what exceeds the dangers of my normal everyday life when giving me an experimental drug without telling me or my family or asking permission to do so? And it, I mean, it, it's anything. It's not just drugs. It's new kinds of bandages and new kinds of stitches. But again, they don't have to ask your permission and the FDA does not have to approve it. Because that takes too long. It takes too long for the FDA to say, you know what, you need to do these clinical trials first. Clinical trials are another thorn in pharmaceutical companies' side. Because sometimes the clinical trials don't do well. And when the clinical trials don't do well, guess what happens? The drug gets pulled and all the money the farm companies spent trying to get it to market and getting it pushed on us by doctors, you know, the farm company to the, to the health insurance approving it and then to the drug dealing doctors and then to the public. It takes a long time and a lot of money and they don't want to lose that all that money. So let's just make guinea pigs out of someone who comes into the ER unconscious. We can't get an informed consent from them anyway. It's our duty to treat them. Ah, let's try the new drug. See what happens. Person's probably going to die anyway from their injuries. And if they do, guess what? We can just say they died from their injuries. Couldn't be the drug that we gave them that was never approved for this kind of injury. It's a scary law. Thank you, Linda, for sharing it with us. And if you want to read more about it, believe me, it's easy to find information. Type into your browser, Cures Act. You just have to type in Cures. It is called the 21st Century Cures Act. It was passed in 2016. And actually, I got most of this information from Wikipedia. But there is a lot of information on it, including how it has uh, detrimentally um, harmed people that it was used on. And there have been lawsuits, and I think there was actually a child that uh, the parents thought they were signing up for just a, a routine study about um, oxygen levels in infants, and it turned out that what they actually signed up for was somehow their child was deprived of oxygen. And they were testing to see how long that would be okay before the child would be in distress. So yeah, we're all being turned into guinea pigs in order for more drugs to be in the market, and more opioid uh, addicts to be born and raised. So, of course, the states are going to need all that Cures Act money for mental health beds and rehab treatment centers because we're all going to be a nation of drug addicts if certain people have their way, including some in our United States government. And that's a really scary thought. Okay, I wanted to talk about one other thing, however, what I'm going to do since we are talking about privacy and sharing of information without consent. Donald Trump did something yesterday that might have you might have missed with all the talk of Russia and Syria and the horrible attack there, and we're praying for all those poor children who were um, exposed to that horrible gas, and 25 of them died, and it was horrible to watch. So we are praying for our Syrian human brothers and sisters and those poor little children. 
Um, but Donald Trump passed a law yesterday that also affects your privacy and your consent. Internet browsers, the people who you get your internet from, Verizon, Comcast. Well, every time you click, like today I clicked on the Cures Act. Well, they can now sell somebody that information. They couldn't before, but they can now. And believe me, if you think you're getting spam email now, you wait. Give it a couple weeks. My God, I like the Hillary Clinton webpage, and every day I am getting emails, spam emails, from Hillary, from Bill, from Chelsea, from the Democratic Party, from the Democratic National Committee, from Bernie Sanders, from President Obama, from Michelle Obama. Pretty soon I'm going to be getting letters from Malia and Sasha Obama, too. It's ridiculous. It already happens. I liked one Planned Parenthood page on Facebook because I do support Planned Parenthood. And now every day I get 12 to 13 emails from somebody affiliated with Planned Parenthood asking me for money or to sign a petition or to do something. Now, my browser, Xfinity, who provides my internet service and sees every keystroke I type, will be able to sell my name my URL, my email account, they will be able to sell my name to advertisers, which is going to make me spend more time deleting all the crap I never opened. And that's going to be a pain in the ass for me, a real pain in the ass. So that happened in politics yesterday, and it is kind of really sad because once again, our privacy is being eroded. And I have Two topics I really want to talk about tomorrow, but we do need to talk about the HIPAA law, and we will do that tomorrow. This show's a little long, and since it's being recorded, I'm not sure how long it's going to take to upload. This is a lot faster, though, and um, I certainly didn't break up or the long pause like we had yesterday from Facebook. So I think these recorded shows are going to be good. So please, um, you know, share share the recorded show when it's up. And let people know that this is how you will be able to find me now. And especially when I get to the Bay, when I'm not sure how the Internet's going to be working, um, the recorded shows are going to be the way to go because I don't need Internet to do these shows. So if the Internet's down or it's a little slow, I can do the show and then put it up when the Internet's running a lot better. Or I could even possibly send it to my husband and he can put it up here in Lancaster on the Comcast uh, Internet. So there's all kinds of things we're going to do to make sure you get this show, but I think this is the way to go from now on. And of course, I will be here all day today and after every recorded show to take comments and answer questions and to hear your views on um, this very scary topic of what is happening to our privacy. And tomorrow we will do the HIPAA. And then I have, um, maybe I'll save the, the other show I was going to do for Friday, since Friday is sort of fun personal Friday for me. I might save that one for then because the HIPAA one is going to be very good and you're going to want to listen um, before you go to the doctor and sign anything. And before you sign those consent forms, make sure you're truly informed. And make sure that you or a family member is informed if your doctor who promised to do your surgery decides not to show up that day. If it's not emergency surgery, you always have the right to say, ah, let's reschedule rain check and get the hell out of there. That, my friends, could save your life. I wish my mom and I had known on April the 8th, 2004, that the surgeon she was depending on decided not to show up for whatever reason that I still don't know. And that someone who had never met her was doing a very tricky surgery that, if, that it was surrounding her bowel. And that somehow that's what ended up killing her. You know, I'm not a genius, but I connected the dots. Can't do anything about it. Because the hospital covered their ass by saying my mother was overweight. And she smoked 10 cigarettes a day. Yeah, they covered their ass real good. And I was too stupid and too naive and too young to ask for an autopsy, which I wish I had. And which I would do in the future if a loved one is in the same situation. So please stay informed, 
especially where your life is concerned. And no surgery is minor. Remember that. I know that from personal experience. Even if 20 million other people had it the same day and survived and everything was great. All that shit they threaten you about, it might be rare, but when it happens to you, it's not so rare anymore. So God bless you, Mom. We're almost coming upon the anniversary of your death. I can't believe it's been this long and that I'm still surviving. It's very hard to survive every day without you. But we had a good run. You were a good mother. We had our problems, as most mothers and daughters do. So this show is dedicated to my mother and to all the mothers out there who come from the generation where you trust the doctor, you don't question the doctor. The doctor's always right. They need daughters like us, children like us, to say, wait a minute, Mom. Maybe we should ask some questions. I wish back then when I was 39 years old, I had asked those questions. I had been smart enough and brave enough. But I wasn't. And there's nothing I can do about that. But I can help all of you. I can inform all of you. Don't live every day not knowing or wondering if you could have done something. It's not fun. So to my mom, Christina Pavlidis Kling, you were awesome. Sometimes I don't always give you credit for as awesome as you were, but I know. And I love you. Always. You'd be proud of me. Political Paula, out.